Around 551 million years ago during the Ediacaran period, weird animals had taken over the seafloor. In the shallows, the slug-like Kimberella lazily mowed down bacteria and algae. In the deeps, fronds of Charnia waved in the current, filter feeding or absorbing nutrients from the water. But in between these bizarre creatures were many animals with a more familiar shape. Elongated tubes, flat ribbons, and other worm-like body plans were so varied and abundant that this part of the Ediacaran is sometimes known as Worm World. But familiar bodies or not, most of the strange organisms of the Ediacaran disappear about 540 million years ago. Lots of different factors probably played a role in this, but the biggest seems to have been a revolutionary adaptation, the ability to dig. While digging worms ending the world sounds like the plot of a certain brilliant monster movie, it really happened, and how it happened is just as odd as the culprits themselves. This is the story of how the ancient worm world was ended by the actions of its very own worms. Though there are amazingly well-preserved soft-bodied fossils from a few places in the world, these types of organisms usually don't fossilize well. This makes it pretty hard to actually catch one of those world-ending worms in the act. So to solve this murder mystery, we're looking at the clues they left behind, trackways, burrows, and well-preserved poo. These are collectively called trace fossils, or more formally, ichnofossils. Like many clues, it's not always clear who left these traces. And sometimes several different organisms can leave almost the same traces too. So trace fossils are all given unique names of their own. Trace fossils made by amoeba-like organisms show up early in Earth's history, but the first definite animal trace fossils show up in the Ediacaran. And traces can be very distinct, like Kimber Ichnus, a series of centimeter-long scratch marks that form trails of radiating fan shapes. It's named for the many body fossils of Kimberella, the suspected trace maker, that are preserved on or near these traces. Scientists call marks like these a grazing trail, or traces left as an animal scraped its mouth across the seafloor, munching on bacteria. Kimber ichnus and fossils like it show that a huge evolutionary innovation had already happened. Some animals were able to detect and move towards food. But these ichnofossils also tell us something important about what these animals were moving across. The trace marks themselves are very shallow and show that the animal was scraping away the top surface of the seafloor to eat. This sounds like a good way to get a mouthful of mud and nothing else, but there actually is a modern version. If you have a fish tank, you can see it for yourself. Aquatic snails leave similar grazing trails as they eat algae that grows on hard surfaces, which means that during the Ediacaran, the substrate, or the seafloor, was very different than it is today. Instead of soft, muddy sand, the sediment was held together so tightly by a mat of bacteria that it formed a hard surface. Scientists call this type of seafloor a mat ground, and it was sometimes so thick and sturdy that it even fossilized itself, creating a texture known as elephant skin. Because the seafloor was so different, the lifestyles of early animals were different too. Most organisms lived on top of the mat or clung to the mat, but didn't really dig too much below it. And not just because it was hard to dig in. The bacteria that likely made the mat grounds typically suck oxygen out of the sediment, and some produce toxic hydrogen sulfide as a byproduct. So even if organisms were inclined to dig or had the ability to dig, they risked suffocation or being poisoned if they spent too long under the ground. But life, uh, finds a way, or in this case, worms did. At the very end of the Ediacaran, a new type of trace fossil shows up. It's called Treptichnus, and it's a small, branching, mostly horizontal burrow. And it's only been in the last few years that scientists have figured out the probable culprit behind these trace fossils, Priapulid worms. Their body fossils are known from at least the early Cambrian, and they're still alive today. Sometimes they wash up on shore in big groups, and their pale pink color and soft exterior has earned them the nickname penis worms. Yes, really, that's what they went with.
See, preapulids have heads that are lined with tiny barbs. They use these to move, hooking into the ground and pulling themselves forward. But these barbs are also used as a type of sensory organ. They poke their barbed heads around as they look for food, leaving traces that look very, very similar to Treptichnus. And some species of modern preapulid worms coat themselves in layers of mucus and bacteria, which helps to protect them from toxic environments. This this makes them very resistant to hydrogen sulfide and anoxia. With that fancy mucus coat and barbed movement system for digging, they would have easily been able to excavate into and survive underneath the mat grounds of the Ediacaran. Which is why it makes sense that Treptichnus shows up in the Ediacaran and then becomes much more common in the early Cambrian. Preapulids also became more common in the Cambrian. We've found nice full body fossils of preapulids like Otoya in the Burgess Shale. Some specimens of Otoya are so well preserved that we can even see tiny arthropods inside their stomach. That means that Otoya may have hidden in its burrow and then attacked prey that came by like a tiny marine version of the graboids from Tremors. Now, while death by barbed penis worm is certainly not an appealing way to go, preapulids themselves didn't bring about the end of worm world. Their burrows did. Burrowing by worms broke up the hard seafloor surface, like tiny ancient plows. Communities of preapulids and other similar organisms changed the seafloor from hard mat grounds to the softer sediment found in the Cambrian. This change is called the Cambrian Agronomic Revolution, which seems like a very peaceful name for what was actually a devastating environmental change. And it was devastating because many early organisms were adapted to life on a solid surface. Organisms like Charnia had survived by fastening themselves into the mats, and they couldn't stay upright in the softer ground. Several groups of Ediacaran animals went extinct completely and others struggled to adapt. But the surviving worms weren't finished yet. Even with all that mixing, the early Cambrian sediment still wasn't as soft as it is today, because most of these burrows were shallow, just a few centimeters deep and mostly horizontal. Which makes sense, because there wasn't really a reason to dig any deeper. After all, most of the decaying organic matter was near the surface, so going down further wouldn't get you any more food. But by the middle Cambrian, a new use for digging had evolved. This is best seen in the trace fossil Scolithos. Unlike the shallow horizontal burrows of Treptichnus, Scolithos burrows are vertical and up to a meter deep. Like all trace fossils, there were probably several types of organisms responsible for making Scolithos, and they might have lived a lot like feather duster worms do today. Feather duster worms are a type of tube worm that dig down into the substrate and filter feed above it with their enormous feathery tentacles. They use their burrows not for food, but for shelter. When scared or threatened, the worms duck down into their hole to hide. The deeper the burrow, the bigger the worm that can hide inside. And so digging deeper suddenly became advantageous. These industrious worms were soon excavating much further than any organism had before, carving out so much sediment that they left behind a type of rock now known as pipe rock. The pipe rocks pushed resources like nitrogen, oxygen, and organic carbon deeper into the sediment. And bacteria followed, forming colonies inside the sand itself, but not making more mat grounds. They didn't even have the chance. Other animals drilled into the substrate after those bacteria, churning up the sediment, driving nutrients even farther down, and so the cycle continued. This change in how animals use the seafloor is known as the Cambrian Substrate Revolution, and it created the ocean bottom we see today. The extensive mat grounds of the Ediacaran retreated to the deepest parts of the ocean, far from intrepid worm excavators, and they're still thriving there to this day. But the rest of the ocean floor is full of holes, burrows, bacteria, and life. And notably, lots and lots of worms. Today, worms have completely taken over. Nematode worms are one of the most abundant multicellular organisms in the ocean, and other species of worms have moved onto land and some even invade our own bodies. So while Treptichnus heralded the end of the Ediacaran worm world, Scolithos created a substrate perfect for the new worm world, the one we still live in today. The Ediacaran worm world is dead. Long live the new worm world.
If you want to learn more about the boom times of the Ediacaran, watch our episode, The Other Explosion You Should Know About. And thanks to this month's eontologist who mean the worm to us. Sean Dennis, Jake Hart, Annie and Eric Higgins, John Davidson Ng, and Patrick Seifert. Become an Eonite at patreon.com slash eons and you could submit a joke for us to read, like this one from Lulu. Did you know that Frank was starting up a Dodo Appreciation Club? I hear it hasn't really gotten off the ground. <laughs> because they can't fly. That's good. And as always, thank you for joining me in the Constantine Hassa studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more journeys in deep time.